Hey there, let's do more time travel debugging. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, I made a video about time travel debugging, which you can watch over here. In that video, I felt that there was way too much information to be put in one video. So I decided to make a second video. In this video, I will continue on time travel debugging and show a few more advanced features that you can do with time travel debugging. Let me show some techniques, how to find all the instances a method was called and all the allocations of memory in which an object was allocated or freed. But first, before watching this video, definitely watch the previous video because what I'm going to do is I'm going to open an existing trace. I'm not going to make a new trace. So definitely watch my previous video on how to capture a time travel trace in the first place and then resume with this video. So let me switch quickly to an instance of Windybug. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open a trace. So what I do is I go to the uh, options menu over here. Usually we would launch an application over here, like launch application advance, or we will open a dump or attach to a process. If we have a time travel trace, we can use another option here called open trace file. And I already have the uh, trace file over here. So I'm just going to press OK and it's just going to load into Windybug. Now, once the trace is open, uh, we get the trace timeline over here. But what Windybug doesn't do is Windybug doesn't actually know where the symbols are and Windybug doesn't know where the source code is. So the first thing I need to do is I need to actually add symbols and then I need to add the source code so that when we do time travel debugging, we can actually see the source code on the screen. Setting the symbols is pretty easy. The first set of symbols is of course the Microsoft symbols. You definitely need the Microsoft symbols. And then I'm just going to add the uh, symbols to my project. So I'm going to do sim path with a plus to just say add. And then I'm just going to do a reload. So this just ensures that I have all the symbols that I need. Adding the source code is also straightforward. So it's just source path and I'm just going to add the source code like that. When you have the source code path, it means that WinDebug will now automatically open the source code. So it's really handy to add the source code path instead of dragging in individual files into WinDebug. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on one of these exceptions over here. So this red triangle over here, these are exceptions. So each one of these uh, exceptions over here in with these uh, red triangles, uh, this was captured ahead of time with my test application. So I'm going to click on the second one over here. When I click on it, after a while, the cursor will move towards the exception. This means that we are forwarded in time to the point where this exception occurred. If I run km over here, because I've loaded all the symbols, I'm actually going to get the um, frames accurately. Uh, don't worry about this warning, unable to verify checksum. Uh, there, there was no checksum in my application in the first place. But the, the thing is that if you get a warning over here that the symbols cannot be matched, definitely stop and fix your symbols. But in my case, the symbols definitely matched. So I'm going to click on one of these functions over here and the source code is going to appear. Let me just move the screen just, just a little bit so that we can read the source. So this function over here, um, it just allocates a bit of memory and it has a counter. And if the counter goes above a certain value, it throws an error. Um, I throws an exception over here. So what I want to do is what if I wanted to know all the times that this method was called? Um, how do I do that? So the technique to do that is pretty complicated. You see, within the debugger, there is something called a data model. The data model over here is a set of objects in which you can query using the DX command and you can get information from the model. The model is very complex. So I think I will skip it for now and I'll just type the command to use the model. I'll make a video in the future all about data models within Windybug because this is a pretty advanced topic. But we can use the model to find information within the trace files so that we can find the number of times a particular method was called. So the technique to do it is, let me just make the screen a bit wider, is to use this command over here, which is the uh, DX command. So this is pretty long and complicated. So let me just break it down. So dx is the command to query. 
Uh, R2, uh, there's a meaning for R2, it's basically uh, the size of what you're querying. Uh, I'll skip that for now, just copy this command. The current session is the name of the um, object that we want. TTD is the time travel debugger and calls is the number of method calls. I can put a string inside and this string is the symbol that we want to trace. So if I run this long winded command, I'll put this in the description of this video so it's easy to copy and paste. If I run this command, I'll get a list of all the times that this method was called. So what's really useful about this list over here is that I can use it to time travel. So let's go to the first time the method was called. So this is the first time it was called. If I click on this time travel over here, the time travel graph will actually move to the first time it was called, which is over here. Now we see that the, the cursor has moved up here is because we have actually time traveled backwards to the first time that this method was called. Now within WinDebug, we can still put breakpoints and the breakpoints will still work. So if I put a breakpoint at this part over here and I just press go, the program will advance to that breakpoint. Let's look at M counter over here. So if I go to view and I go to uh, locals, uh, I'm going to remove the uh, timeline just for, for now to keep the screen um, decent. Um, I look at the disk, I see that the counter is 1 over here, the counter is 1. So if I want to step backwards, I can do step over back over here. And if I do that, it actually moves backwards. You see the counter now is 0 because it hasn't run this line. Now I can step over forward again and the counter is 1. So this is extremely powerful because we can find all instances of where a method was called and we can move up and down the graph. We can actually see how variables are changing and the number of times the variables are changing. This even works um, if I put a few breakpoints, like I can put a breakpoint here and over here and it even works if I go back and if I go forward, there you see the uh, variable is changing, I can go back again, I can go forward again. Really, really powerful stuff. The other buttons to step into, step out, um, these work as well. Like if I do step out back over here, it goes back. And if I do run more time, it's going to go to the calling function. The opposite of that would be um, if I do a step into. I got to press it two times and I'll go back into the uh, function. So you can also traverse to down the call stack and back up again. Uh, once all the information is in the time travel file, uh, it's pretty easy. You can find any method you want and you can put a breakpoint and you can travel up and down as many times as you want in order to figure out what exactly happened in your program. So within this program, I've got an object over here and it actually is possible to look at all the objects on the heap. So let's do that. So I'm at an arbitrary breakpoint. It doesn't actually matter where the breakpoint is. Um, you can look at the memory by actually specifying uh, DX, which is to query the uh, model. Uh, R1, just, just memorize this command for now. I will make a video in the future explaining exactly the breakdown of how you get these commands. It is a bit involved, so I figured I'll make a dedicated video about it. So current session, time travel debug, data heap, and I sort by uh, descending order from the time start. What this command does is that it will query all the objects on the heap. Let me just move this down a bit. And these objects, on the heap will include the object I allocated on line 13. Let me just find one of these large objects and travel to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the uh, window over there and I'm going to open the timeline from over here. And then let me just find one of these uh, large objects. So I'm going to take this object over here, this alloc over here. If I click on the object, I get information about the object. But if I click on the time travel over here, what will happen is the timeline will actually move to where the uh, time travel is. Let me just view the function that created this object. So if I run km and look at the stack, I can just look at the top of the stack and I see RTL allocate heap. So this method over here allocate, um, which is a malloc, uh, was allocated from within MFC itself. And there is a particular object that was being allocated. So this introduces a kind of problem. When I run the uh, command to view the um, heap over here, I can't really tell from here uh, which objects are the objects that I wrote and which objects are part of the framework. Um, you have the information of the size, which is the middle part over here, the size, 
but I can't really tell from here with the without some elaborate way of figuring out the address, uh, which objects it is. Technically, it is possible to script that if I can see the pointer here, I can find it from here. I will make a video dedicated to do that because the syntax to do that is very complicated. But for now, just the ability to go forward and back in the uh, time travel should suffice. I have never found a solid reason to use the memory heap checking of the time travel. It might be important if you have memory corruption to go back before the corruption, but I have never used it in any practical way. So I'll need to figure out a way that you could map this address to this pointer here and quickly find um, any object that was allocated. The table, however, does indicate that if memory is reallocated or it is freed, so there is a lot of potential if we can script it accurately to figure out which pointers are being allocated and, and freed. Um, it has a lot of potential to figure out um, if there's any code that uses a pointer after it has been freed or a corrupted pointer. So there's a lot of potential here, but I have never used it in a practical environment. I've used a lot of other memory debugging tools, but not the time travel debugging. Anyway, running the debugger forward and back that's extremely powerful all by itself and being able to see local variables while doing so that's a gold mine in debugging i wish i had this functionality many years ago in the older versions of windebug i'll definitely be using this functionality now but i wish i had this capability a long time ago anyway let me know in the comments below if you have ever used time travel debugging, especially used it in this way, or if you have ever used the debugging model within WinDebug and queried it, let me know in the comments below how you how it went and how you managed to use it in a productive way. Gentle reminder to subscribe, hit that bell icon and give a like if you like the content. As always, it's been a pleasure bringing you this information. I am High Voice, signing out.